To a certain extent, they felt out of their depth. They'd not worked with electric guitars and drums and so forth, and indeed many other musicians before. So they were happy to sit and listen and see how it came together. We dreamed our way through that recording, I think. We'd never seen this sort of stuff done. We were an unaccompanied group. You were flying. One of the things that they did so very, very well was being able to describe absolutely everyday situations in very, very beautiful terms. And that's a real gift, and that's a pop music gift for me. Child Among the Weeds is absolutely extraordinary song. I don't believe that part of that was because Lal had a very difficult childbirth with our Oliver. And Oliver was twins, and they lost his sister. And A Child Among the Weeds is a very graphic description of, of a woman giving birth. was dreading Fly Bird Fly because it wasn't in my key at all and I was going to have to drink half a bottle of port and cross my legs to do that one and Bob Davenport walked in and Bob is the man who faced with a song in the wrong key just sings it it's bloody mindedness <laughs> pure and simple the day has only just begun the silver sun is shining Wake up, wake up, everyone, the day is only dazzling. Fly, bird, fly. If you'd never heard anything else on that album, when it absolutely tapes off, it's almost like orthodox church music. It's like a liturgy, and to hear it in this setting is just absolutely extraordinary. It was done in one take. <laughs> no overdubs, no nothing. But I just played a harmonic and I thought, oh, that sounds nice, and played another harmonic and then just played a few more. It sounds like an absolute right. moment. And the hair stood on end and you just <laughs> played, please don't screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> This is the time when Norma and I met up and decided to get married. But it was during the week we were making Bright Phoebus album that all that stuff happened. But I mean, it was a long time coming. Why was it a long time coming? Because we met in 1961, she was married and I wasn't. So uh, next time we met in 63, she wasn't married and I was. <laughs> then she went away to Montserrat for four years. Then Bright Phoebus got made and she and I finally talked to each other properly in a manner of speaking and decided at the end of that week we'd get married. I think Never the Same is my absolute favourite and Red Wine Promises as well because there's a romantic story attached to Red Wine Promises about my mum and dad and that kind of thing. It's just me on guitar and Norma singing, isn't it? It's no Richard. I don't know why nothing was added but it was decided that that was it. She went out with our George, her husband, uh, onto Beverly Road in Hull, had a bottle of red wine, came back through Pearson's Park, pouring down with rain so she leapt these metal hoop fence things, you know. Didn't make it, splat on her back, and she wrote, fell in the street in a drunken heap. drunken heap There's bright water all around me And the cheap red wine in my drunken brain has left a burning flame As the recording of Bright Phoebus drew to a close, spirits ran high. Lala and Mike Waterson began to get a sense of the enormity of what their songs had achieved. 
I don't have the words to describe it. It was just sheer, unimaginable joy. Something that you've written just suddenly multiplied by 10. I think there's no doubt that we realised when it was all finished that it was a great album. And then we just kind of sat back and waited. Waited for what, exactly? <laughs> waited for what? Um, I think we sat back and waited for a spectacularly successful embracing of the album. We all knew that we'd done something extraordinary and it did not get good reviews. Johnny can play Rosemary sitting in a shower of rain Sunny, sunny days of all Turned over to filthy weather Dave Bulmer was a young accordion player on the folk circuit. Supplementing his income by selling records for Bill Leader at his shows, he stumbled on a career as a record distributor. In 1972, Dave was charged with the job of selling Bright Phoebus to record shops. The press 2,000 copies, but a 1,000 of them were faulty. And Bill told me that they couldn't do anything with these records. So they basically ended up with a 1,000 copies. And it wasn't one of the better sellers, if I remember rightly. No, <laughs> it didn't go well at all, no. The record basically became a catalogue item very quickly. You've got to understand that this was missing traditional music. A lot of people looked down their nose at us for doing that. So it must have been a dreadful surprise, in a way, when it came out and some negative reviews started appearing in the press which seemed not to understand what you were trying to do. It, it, does, really it doesn't matter. But did, I, I understand that you actually had people going up to you at shows and saying, well, what did you make that record for, you know? Well, yeah, you know. That must have been devastating, though. You do what you do. Who were you making the record for? It seems to me that the record sort of mapped out possibilities, for English music in particular, that never quite materialised as fully as we might expect. Yes, I think you're looking at an album that showed ways that English music could go from there. It was to get worse for Bright Phoebus. Ten years later, in 1982, interest in folk music had dipped to an all-time low. Bill Leader, unable to pay his debts, sold on all the titles on his trailer label, including Bright Phoebus. After changing hands again, Trailer's back catalogue was bought by the musician who'd had the task of selling it to record shops in the first place, Dave Bulmer. I know when we took the thing over, there was somewhere in the region of 400 vinyl copies and we've still got hundreds left. There was very little interest compared to other things we were doing. Things like the Martin Burns album that Bill did, which is one of the best fiddle albums I'd ever heard as a kid. So we put that out straight away. Money's limited, it's not an unlimited situation. You've got to put it where you believe you can afford to put your money. As CDs gradually usurped vinyl in the affections of music fans, Bright Phoebus remained conspicuous by its continued absence from record shops. Inevitably, its status assumed mythical proportions, both to those who heard it, but perhaps more so for those who hadn't. For Martin Carthy and others, it was a profound source of exasperation. I am bewildered at his reluctance to put this stuff out. Bright Phoebus is a shining, shining piece of work. It's an album that he's talked about a lot these days. I mean, it should surely be a fairly straightforward thing, shouldn't it? I mean, it would be in everyone's interest, wouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> That's the short answer. I can't speak for Dave Wilmer. I have not the slightest idea why he will not do anything f or do much about putting that album out. Sleeping in my bed. If I remember rightly, it was by few of us, we had a problem over contracts, which we needed copies of. Those copies were found. The stuff was checked up with the PRS to make sure everything was registered correctly, and it wasn't. You'd think it would be a very simple thing to do, but actually some of these organisations can take years to sort the simplest of things out. When we got that cleared up, we put it out on CD, and that was it as far as I was concerned. Mike Waterson. He reprinted it and brought it out with no publicity, no push. I did a couple of interviews, and it fizzed. Again, didn't do anything. That must feel really frustrating to sort of know that it's not generally widely available. Anybody that wants a copy can get a copy. Of course you can get it. Anybody can get it. It sells and trickles away, but that's about as far as you could say it goes. 
And in most folk records, that's what actually happens. They don't actually earn back the cost of putting them out. Without going into complications, he copied the LP. I know he didn't have the tapes, the masters. Who has the masters? My lips are sealed. <laughs> oh, no, I had the master tapes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that one, the tapes are there. The original contract for Bright Phoebus, as signed by all the musicians, said that if sales of the record fail to exceed 2000, thus effectively failing to cover the cost of production, the artist would be due no royalties. I sent him a copy. I copied everything we had on paper to him. Bill was very good. He had everything documented. Basically, they don't earn any royalties off it because in the contract there's no royalties. They signed it. He turned round to me not so long back and said, I'm refusing to pay you any royalties whatsoever. I don't like you. That's absolute rubbish. Never said that. That's absolute garbage. If Mike said that, I'm really surprised. I mean, we used to do gigs at his club back in the 70s over in the rugby and hall. I know him. Father says kill man, preacher says God's will be done. Mother says be still man, Moses in the meadow. The sheep are on the hill still, and the beds are on the willow. It's nine years, isn't it, since Lal died, is that right? Yeah. She had a chest infection and then decided to go for a chest x-ray and it was too late. And Lal never looked after herself. I mean, the hero in my thing is our George, her husband, who looked after her, who let her spend all day painting, who let her write poems and songs, you know, who cleaned the house and cooked the meals after he'd been to work. If Lal was here now and she could sort of see us making a fuss about this record, what, what do you think she'd say? That it's all gone. Songwriting's therapeutic, and as much as once you've written it, it's gone. And you're better. But it isn't all gone. As the territorial battles of the old folk scene gradually shrink in the rearview mirror of time, Bright Phoebus's place in the pantheon of folk seems a little greater with every passing year. How ironic that these songs were once so disparaged for the mere fact that they were written by the people who sang them. The mark of their greatness is that they don't sound like they were ever written. They sound like they were always out there, awaiting excavation from the North Yorkshire Moors where Lal spent many of her happiest years. I would happily play Bright Phoebus to anyone who needs to learn a little bit more about the history of popular music in this country. I mean, I have a son who's 15 now, and this is one of the albums he needs to hear. Are these folk songs? What are they? Um, they're art songs, aren't they? I don't know. <laughs> if you'd asked me that question 10 years ago, I would have said, no, they're pop songs. Now I would probably say that they're folk songs. They're not traditional songs. Or if you got me drunk, I might say pop songs. <laughs> It's very, very strange. You start writing a song and you get your first verse and then the song takes over and it leads you not where you want to be. Most of the songs in Bright Phoebus was where we wanted to be, in that little daydream world. She was a bloody fool because she lived on coffee and toast and cigarettes. But what she managed to do, as far as I was concerned in her lifetime, was magnificent. Today. 